All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the last seminar of the uh, Health Law Institute uh, seminar series. Um, we have an amazing speaker and an amazing topic to, to end our series. We're so happy to have Professor McIntosh here with us. Um, my name is Adelina Iftene, and I'm the Associate Director of the Health Law Institute. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you here. We are talking to you, both myself and uh, Professor McIntosh from Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Um, we, uh, I'm going to introduce Professor McIntosh in, uh, in a couple of seconds. Uh, just uh, a couple, a few um, housekeeping, uh, housekeeping points that I would like to make. Um, there is a Q&A box and I am going to ask that uh, um, you, I'm going to ask that you use that box for uh, typing your questions. You can do so at any point in time during the, um, uh, during the talk and I am going to come back and filter the, uh, uh, the, the question at the end. Um, also, if you wish to use closed captioning, we have live closed captioning and I have just posted the link for that in the, um, in the chat box. Um, I think with that said, we can, uh, we can uh, get started. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, our, our guest today is Professor Constance McIntosh, who um, uh, is a, a full professor here at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie. Um, she is uh, currently the acting scholarly director for the uh, McKean Institute for Public Policy and Governance, and she served as the Viscount Bennett Professor of Law from 2018 to 2021. Um, she's the director, she was the director of Dalhousie's Health Law Institute from 2011 to 2017. Um, and she also served as the leader of the policing, justice, and security domain for the Atlantic Metropolis Ac uh, Center of Excellence uh, between uh, 2010 and uh, uh, 2011. Much of Professor McIntosh's work as a legal scholar has focused on identifying and making recommendations to overcome legal and policy barriers to realizing culturally relevant health equity. A constant focus uh, has been how indigenous health inequities are generated and perpetuated by legal structures, including jurisdictional, constitutional, and governance divisions, as well as the very manner by which unilaterally developed federal policy is used in lieu of binding legal frameworks. Professor McIntosh has also turned her attention to the intersection of law and policy with the health interests and status of refugee communities, would-be immigrants with disabilities, and temporary foreign workers, which is something we're going to be hearing about today. Um, her work on the intersection on law and policy with the health of indigenous peoples is featured in numerous peer-reviewed publications and books, and leading health law and policy textbooks. She is also the co-author of the leading Canadian textbooks on public law and on immigration and refugee law. Professor McIntosh has also worked closely with the Nova Scotia Department of Health and Wellness on multiple law and policy reform projects with Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada on reforming gender persecution guidelines and has served as an expert panel member with the Canadian Council of um, Academies, as well as the Nova Scotian Independent Review of Hydraulic Fracturing. She has a long-standing relationship with the Immigrant Settlement Association of Nova Scotia, where she oversees a pro bono legal information clinic. Uh, today, Professor McIntosh will uh, uh, present on her long, uh, work over the last uh, couple of years on COVID-19 and migrant workers. And I just have to read the title because I love it so much, Guardian Angels and Sacrificial Lambs, COVID-19 and Migrant Workers. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Constance. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm just going to um, get my screen set up. There we go. Hopefully y'all can see that. Um, so this is part of a bigger project and I'm just going to be dipping into various parts of it and not, I could go way more into depth on everything. So um, if anything, uh, you know, grab someone's interest along the way, uh, you know, please do take me back to it later. So Have a moment with my multiple screens. Okay. So this is an image of Mr. Luis Gabriel Flores. Um, he was a, a Mexican migrant worker from Mexico, and he was employed to do seasonal farm work labor for Scotland Sweetpat Growers Inc. in the summer of 2020. 
So in late June, just after uh, Mr. Flores recovered from COVID-19, and he was one of the 190 workers who tested positive at his work site during that specific outbreak, um, he was terminated by his employer. And he was terminated because he voiced concerns about whether his employer was doing enough to protect workers from COVID-19. And he was galvanized because one of the people in his 13 bed bunk house was Mr. Juan Lopez Caparo. And Mr. Caparo had also tested positive during that outbreak. And after the outbreak quarantine ended, um, they all returned together to the bunk house. But Mr. Flores was concerned that Mr. Caparo, he didn't seem well. And so Mr. Um, uh, Flores alerted Scotland Farms. And Mr. Caparo died two days later from, from COVID-19. And the, the owners then met with the workers and they told them that Mr. Caparo had, had died. And at that moment, Mr. Flores spoke directly with the, the farm owners, telling him, you know, through a translator, because Mr. Flores didn't speak English, telling him the workers had to be better looked after with COVID. The next morning, the owner confronted Mr. Flores, angry, because a, a video had circulated on social media which showed housing conditions on the farm and also identified some health concerns. And, and the owner was pretty sure that he could spot Mr. Flores in the video. Uh, Mr. Flores denied he was in the video, irrelevant. Mr. Flores was told he was gonna go back to Mexico and it turned out a flight had already been booked. Fortunately, while Mr. Flores was in quarantine during the outbreak, he'd been contacted by um, a, a migrant advocacy lawyer. And so he managed to text her, she arranged to have him picked up, and instead of being forced on a flight back to Mexico that day, he stayed in Canada. And he was able to turn to legal action, but it wasn't under the legal regime that had brought him to Canada, which is supposed to protect him while he labored here. Um, under that regime, the regime for seasonal agricultural workers, an employer can unilaterally, that is, without review, without appeal, terminate and repatriate a worker for alleged non-compliance. Now, I'm gonna to return to this story and what it tells us about the law and COVID-19 and precarious labor, but first I'm gonna tell you another story about things that were happening at the same time. And in the spring and summer of 2020, there was this real buzz um, among uh, NGOs, lawyers, workers themselves, people who for, for decades have been speaking about, about how uh, migrant workers with temporary or uncertain status, usually from the global south, usually racialized, work in the global north, doing jobs um, in sectors marked by the three Ds, right? dirty, dangerous, demeaning, where their, their willingness to do what is, is termed in the literature unfree labor. It's maintained by this, this intersection of southern poverty and northern legal structures that maintain precarity. So there was a bond within the community that's doesn't like this situation um, because people witnessed something of a rupture. There was an idea that this crisis, it might, might open policy windows. And we saw some um, discursive and conceptual shifting about migrant workers, especially those working in agriculture in Canada and in, in other Northern states, because suddenly their defining feature wasn't that they performed low skilled labor which was the justification for their access to the Northern job market being on a, on a very temporary basis with very few rights. Rather, their defining feature became they did essential work. And so the public in these countries, especially in the spring of 2020, became aware both of the Northern dependence on these workers for food security, and also some of the appalling conditions under which they toiled, which were also potential outbreak centers for COVID-19. So we have this marriage of state concern and citizen awareness and this potential for change. And I'm gonna to talk today about migrant workers in Canada, um, how the, the COVID-19 pandemic is continuing to play out for diverse communities in their search for income security and safe working conditions. And, Although I'm mostly today going to talk about seasonal farm workers, I'm also going to reference some other migrants who have temporary work permits. And I'm going to get into some how some were recognized as guardian angels and the gates open for them, while others remained in the role of what I'm going to call sacrificial lambs for the sake of analogy. So I'm starting the story with our guardian angels, and I've got to give you some context here. In the three years prior to, um, let's see if I can open this up a little bit more. 
In the three years prior to COVID-19, starting in 2017, there, there was a significant flow of refugee claimants crossing the Canadian-American border by jumping a ditch from Vermont to bring themselves into Quebec onto Roxham Road. And they were entering Canada at this strange location because of the safe third country agreement between Canada and the states, which intentionally and explicitly does not apply to unofficial border crossings like ditches. The agreement provides that, with a couple of exceptions, if a refugee claimant um, asks for protection at an official border post between Canada and the United States, they are deflected back to the country that they transited to for their claim to be heard. And a lot of refugee claimants who managed to make their way into the United States, they actually want their claim to be heard in Canada. And there's, there's lots of reasons for this. Um, our legal regime recognizes gender-based persecution. We recognize persecution on the basis of gender identity as being grounds for protection. In the US, persecution is interpreted far more narrowly. Those grounds are effectively excluded. Um, the United States routinely detains asylum seekers. That's not routine in Canada. And in 2017, when the surge started, um, separating children from parents was also standardized. And you probably saw those pictures of kids in cages, um, as was detaining children. And as we know, many children are still separated in states. So as an aside, that agreement is going to the Supreme Court of Canada this year on the question of whether sending refugee claimants back to automatic detention violates the charter. Anyway, one of the safest places to enter Canada from the US that avoids the safe third country agreement so people don't get deflected back is Roxham Road. And our border agents, they're waiting for them. They see them coming. People go through health and safety screenings and the application begins. So the safety of this crossing, this ditch, the immediacy, the effectiveness of it, American policies after 17, 2017, it led to a large number of asylum claimants um, living in Quebec, and in particular in Montreal, while they wait for their claim to be heard. And the other little background piece here is that our standard Canadian process is, we'll give asylum claimants open work permits. So while they wait for their claim to be heard, they can be self-sustaining instead of, of being on social assistance. And similarly, if a claim is not successful, um, a claimant may remain in Canada for a while while their departure is arranged, during which time we will likely give them another open work permit so they can support themselves. Not surprisingly, the jobs these migrants procure, they're seldom highly desirable ones. Well. When COVID-19 hit, Quebec found its long-term care homes, other healthcare facilities to be utterly overwhelmed. And in, in April, Quebec asked for anyone who was willing to work at long-term care homes to please apply for positions. And according to the media, asylum seekers and others with tenuous immigration status applied in droves. So these individuals filled these poorly paid positions, which were, I mean, Residents of nursing homes and seniors' homes were 80% of all reported COVID-19 deaths in the first wave. Um, infections among staff at these facilities, they were over 10% of the total case count. So that's where they went. And ironically, a month before, um, asylum seekers were stepping into these high-risk healthcare roles to take care of vulnerable Canadians. Canada departed from a plan to, to quarantine, as COVID hit, to quarantine all asylum seekers who crossed the American border, and instead issued an order in council on March 20th that resulted in all asylum seekers um, entering Canada at any point from the United States to be uniformly deflected back to the US. So we barred anyone from entering Canada to make a claim for protection on the basis that, in the preamble, the government found there was no reasonable alternative to prevent the introduction or spread of COVID-19. So about 500 asylum seekers were bounced back into the United States and into automatic detention um, before we stopped enforcing these orders in November of 2021, um, some 18 months later. 
and the, the, we still kind of let these things fall a few months after a legal challenge was, was launched with regards to this practice. Now, ironically, again, you know, one likely consequence of this 20 month refugee ban was predicted by the Parliamentary Standing Committee in 2002, who endorsed the Safe Third Country Agreement, leaving these border gaps. And they said, we gotta leave them in place because of the experience of other countries like Germany who tried these things out. We've got to leave gaps in place because other, so as to keep smugglers out of business, to help keep human trafficking down, um, to make it more likely that anybody who entered irregularly would report to the government. And they highlighted how important this was for public health protections. You don't want people going underground with unknown public health risks. So some predicted at the time um, that this order ostensibly to protect Canadian public health would put Canadian public health at risk because we've got no screening, no quarantining. Um, we're increasing border crossing attempts at dangerous locations, increasing the underground population. We don't know what happened. So much for public health. Canada didn't need to choose between protecting human rights and ostensibly protecting public health. We could have explicitly done both. In my opinion, we did neither. Anyway. Some of these asylum seekers, the ones who got in before March 20th and took these positions in April, working at long-term care homes to take positions that Canadians wouldn't work in because of the work conditions and the risk of death, they have been fast-tracked for permanent residency and citizenship as a reward um, under the Guardian Angel Program. Um, you thought I made that up in the title. So failed refugee claimants, those with pending claims who worked in patient care roles in long-term care homes and uh, health facilities in the first wave could become citizens if they met certain other criteria like having worked a certain number of hours uh, and, uh, and language proficiency. So cross the border on March 19th and a refugee claimant could become a guardian angel for putting themselves in the path of COVID-19 to care for vulnerable Canadians try to cross the border anywhere from March 20th, and 500 refugee claimants are sent into American uh, immigration detention because Canada saw no other reasonable alternative for protecting Canadians from COVID-19. So although Canada couldn't identify a reasonable alternative to barring the entry of people seeking asylum because of the risk that they brought COVID-19 was too high, Canada had no problem finding a route for migrants to work for agri-food and to harvest our crops. Six days after Canada said COVID left us with no alternative but to ban cross-border refugee claimants, Canada revised previously issued border orders that barred most people from entering except for essential purposes. So Canada ignored arguments that protection from persecution was an essential purpose for crossing the border, but responded to concerns raised by Canadian farmers and seafood harvesters who argued that temporary migrant workers were essential, so should be granted entry. New order and councils issued, they're deemed essential, and it's like, well, you can read this, temporary foreign workers in agriculture, agri-food, seafood processing, um, they're on in to protect trade, commerce, health, and food security. Now, Canada wasn't exaggerating the importance of these workers for food security, or at least for agri-food industry. Scotland Sweet Pat Growers Group, for example, like that's where Mr. Caparo died. That was the place that fired Mr. Flores. It has 74 million in annual sales, um, and 70% of its crop goes to the United States. I'm just flagging that there for the whole Canadian food security argument. Now, there are exceptions which must not be forgotten in the mix, um, but most migrant farm workers are not working on small scale family farms. Most are hired by large corporate entities. So to meet this demand for low cost food, low cost labor from March 2020 to June 2021, about 80,000 migrant um, agricultural workers entered Canada. Um, so I just need to tap on this one last time, despite COVID creating so much risk that Canada had to deflect 500 refugee claimants back into American immigration detention, um, where migrant workers were able to come, but what next? Well, 
the federal government, good on them, they move real fast to enact changes to regulations, um, to create programs and policies coordinated with um, Employment and Social Development Canada, and that's the de government department that oversees things on the ground, um, to regulate the conditions under which agricultural migrant workers would work during COVID-19. Now, had those regulations not been placed upon a legal structure which privatizes immigration decisions, and which was already known to produce incredible health and safety vulnerabilities, had those regulations and programs been enforced, they could have significantly addressed the health and safety risks of the workers. So I'm making the big claims here. And once again, I need to back up a little bit and quickly frame out how the very structure of the program produces and sustains vulnerability before moving into the unfulfilled promises, laws to protect workers. So on this slide, <coughs> excuse me, I've summarized elements of the system. The, 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 so the whole legal system, and it's a combination of legislation, um, bilateral agreements between Canada and southern, um, largely Caribbean South countries, and, and standardized form contracts. And I've produced very precise publications about how this precarity is um, crafted. If people want that sort of information, I get it to you later. So here's what it does. It ties the work permit to an individual employer. So although in theory, the migrant worker can change their employer, in reality, they can't if the working conditions are objectionable. It requires, except in British Columbia, workers to live in employer supplied housing. So they are not circulating and accessing the broader community, right? They are isolated and they need to tolerate whatever they find themselves living in. Um, it effectively places access to health and medical care in the hands of the employer who acts as an intermediary because the employer gets the workers' health care cards and the workers are usually dependent upon the employer if they wanted to go to a health clinic for care. And the regime explicitly permits the employer to dismiss migrant employees on medical grounds. So if a migrant worker seeks to access medical care and it's determined they need a break from work, they have an injury, the employer can forcibly repatriate them, gone. Um, the employer has the right to dismiss and repatriate employees on the vague ground of non-compliance. And there is no review or appeal mechanism, right? It's legal exceptionalism. Um, home state consulates are to be consulted, but I know of no cases of objections being raised, because if they do, the home state risks the farm hiring nationals from one of the other source countries the next year, um, resulting in that home state losing the remittances their citizens need, along with the fees that the home state charges the workers they place. Um, and I should have said this first, the employers hand pick who they are willing to hire in subsequent growing seasons. Um, so they decide who's coming back and who's not. And if a worker is not rehired by an employer, the home country is unlikely to keep them in the pool of potential workers. So who is going to risk contacting health and safety officials in a province if the outcome means that individual worker doesn't have a job next year? Who is going to go see a doctor for a sprained wrist instead of just trying to work through it if that means being sent home now? And when someone is sent home, let's be clear, although these workers pay into unemployment insurance and they are um, entitled to workers' compensation, they cannot access those things when the work permit ends and when they are deported. Like this just doesn't happen. So the system turns on Southern poverty and Northern legal exceptionalism. Now, to be clear, I am not saying that all employers set out to exploit. I'm not saying that all migrant agricultural workers experience exploitation. And some employers have great and respectful relationships with their workers. Some bunk houses are in good conditions with like pool tables, satellite TV. What I'm saying is that the system creates a structure which fosters precarity, health and safety risks, and perpetual fear of employer discretion. And this isn't a secret. I'm not like the one letting things out of the can here. Um, there was a 2016 human rights claim, um, which failed, by the way, um, in which the tribunal made a couple of findings that, you know, 
this closed employment relationship, this risk and fear of repatriation means reluctance to make complaints, including health and safety complaints, willing to work when sick or injured, less able to resist work demands, the conditions, greater risk of experiencing health issues. So on the ground, this has meant decades of reports of exploitative working conditions, workers working when ill or injured, living in unhygienic, overcrowded, dilapidated housing with inadequate sanitation. So that's our starting point, okay? It's this, I'm gonna say a failing structure that produces precarity, health and safety risks. And Canada's like, whoa, we gotta put a regime on top of this to mitigate these crazy COVID-19 health and safety issues. So a bunch of regulations and funding support programs came into play. And they look pretty good, okay? They look pretty good. So here's some of the highlights. Um, workers, just like everybody else, Quarantine for two weeks when they cross the border. Um, location has to permit physical distancing. When they're in quarantine, they get paid. Okay, they get paid two weeks work. Anybody who has symptoms or tests positive, separate accommodations. And when they're in quarantine, they're given cleaning supplies. They're given clean drinking water. They are required by the to be given adequate food. And once they get um, out of quarantine, uh, only workers who house together can work closely, otherwise they have to be physically distanced while working. And the feds gave the employers $1,500 per worker. So about $800 of that would be the two weeks of wages during quarantine, so no money out of the pockets of the employers there. And about 700 would then be available for, for modifying or creating accommodations per person. And Employment and Social Development Canada, which as I mentioned oversees the program, they said, well, our priority is going to be um, agriculture this year because workers rely on employer housing and um, quarantine inspections, outbreak inspections, those are our top priorities. So, ma'am, this was looking pretty darn good. And go Canada. The inspections were amazing, right? So the inspection reports were almost 100% in 2020 and 2021 said all employers are complying with all COVID-19 protective requirements. You're like, wow. Then in the fall of 2021, the Auditor General released an audit of the regime and they went through the inspection files and they found that the files actually provided little assurance of protection for health and safety because there was no or little evidence of compliance in the files. Um, they found that in 2020, three quarters of the quarantine inspections did not provide evidence of compliance, and yet the employer was found to comply almost 90% in 2021. And um, the, over a third of the files lacked any documentation, even when asked, to show that the workers received the quarantine pay. And the Auditor General said, we have no evidence here that the money actually went into the pockets of the workers during quarantine or that this money was spent on upgrading um, housing. And as to general living conditions, um, they found that, and this is just like the basic stuff that the, the, the government's supposed to be doing, like is the running water, is the housing overcrowded, is the housing free from health and safety risks, um, the departments collected almost no information on any employer, but still deemed the employers compliant. And some of the reports actually had um, uh, clear evidence that rules were not being followed. And yet there was no evidence of government follow-up and the employer was still deemed compliant. And then these positive inspection reports were used to um, release to the employer additional supplemental COVID-19 support funding. So they got more money um, after potentially not doing what they were supposed to do with the first bags of money. And there were unconscionable delays with outbreak inspections. 80% um, of files showed a one to two month delay between when there was notification of an outbreak and when the department looked into the outbreak. And 
One to two month delays means there was no opportunity to actually verify the quarantine conditions when people were in quarantine and take action when needed. And in one outbreak file, um, the employer was unusually interviewed just seven days after the case was opened. And in the interview, the employer testified that the foreign workers who tested positive had not been placed in separate accommodations, so they were violating our new regulations. And Employment and Social Service, Employment and Social Development Canada did not do anything, did not respond to this information for more than a month. And the follow-up was to ask the employer to provide isolation accommodations that complied with the law and to send us a photograph to prove that there was separate accommodations. And four months later, when the file was being reviewed, the photographs hadn't been sent, the employer had sent nothing, and the government had not followed up either. So the Auditor General's report, it, um, it lined up with much of what migrant advocacy groups were claiming during the pandemic. And one group, uh, Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, um, they set up a phone line for migrant workers in, in southern Ontario in Spanish. And the purpose of this phone line is, is they, they, they share information, legal information with migrant workers. And they compiled a report of calls from March to May of 2020, just three months. And they had 300 calls about not receiving quarantine wages. They had 500 calls about inadequate food being provided during quarantine. They had 160 calls about quarantine conditions, not permitting social distancing. And those housing conditions, which I mentioned already, ain't that great, um, became worse for many workers after they left quarantine because remember that COVID rule that said that workers who bunked together didn't need to be physically distanced when working? So some employers increased the number of people sleeping in the already overcrowded bunk houses. So I think you've guessed who my sacrificial lambs are. Now, some workers tried to sort of push back more directly and, and two migrant workers in British Columbia invited um, members of the, the migrant support group to, to visit. But the employer had created a workplace rule and these rules were happening at all um, seasonal uh, farming work sites across Canada. Workers could not have anyone enter their bunkhouse or their property, and they were not allowed to themselves leave the property, all in the name of COVID-19. Now, I'm not just talking about those provincial lockdown moments when we were all stuck in our houses. I'm talking about the whole time they were there. They were not allowed to leave, and no one could come in. These two migrant workers invited um, uh, members of a, a migrant support group to come. The employer found out about those visitors fired the workers for non-compliance, right? Which the employer has the right to do. And the two were then deported. Didn't work out so well there. Let's to go back to Mr. Flores. So that was the guy who was fired after raising concerns about COVID-19 safety after his bunkmate died. As mentioned, he already had community and legal contacts. He was outside of the control of his employer. So they brought an action, but it wasn't under the migrant worker regime. It was under provincial occupational health and safety. And he argued that he had been wrongfully dismissed as a wrongful, sorry, he'd been dismissed as a wrongful reprisal for raising health and safety issues. Um, he was successful. He got $25,000 in damages. He was unable to find another job. That's it for him. Going forward, um, we've had a couple of really good changes. I keep take, I'm, I know it's a bit of a seesaw. Um, so Canada has a policy under which migrants with temporary work permits that are employer specific, like our seasonal workers, they can get an open work permit that's also temporary. It only goes as long as the original one, if they prove abuse. And in <laughs> proving abuse isn't that easy, but anyway, in June, 2021, Canada revised that policy um, to define abuse they, they, to, as including abuse specific to the context of COVID-19, which is good, right? It, it creates a situation where people are more likely to get out of danger. And here's the grounds that they said are now abuse. And you, they, they shouldn't be a surprise to you. But in effect, you know, what's happened here is that the workers have been downloaded the job 
of policing their employers, because these are exactly the sorts of employee employer behaviors which the inspection should have been monitoring and correcting for. This is about a failure to comply with the law. This should have been happening at a system level, but the government failed to do so. So it's now downloaded on the workers. Um, but also recall these protections are built in a system that generates precarity, which is still largely in place. And in particular, employers still unilaterally decide who to call back the next year. So any employee who walks because the employer is violating the COVID-19 health and safety rules, they're not going to get hired back by anyone next year, right? Once recall, there's this coercive marriage of Southern poverty and Northern legal exceptionalism. So I'm going to wrap it up and hopefully allow us some time and space for some uh, conversation. And this is just a random little bunch of, of, of uh, headline things. So, so I talked today, probably too quickly, um, about migrant workers in Canada. I talked about how the COVID-19 pandemic is, is playing out for that diverse community. Um, it made many workers who were already vulnerable far more precarious. It heightened their health and safety risks. Um, especially those working in the essential industry of agri-food. And for a few um, migrant workers, though, such as those working in healthcare roles and places like long-term care homes and some other streams that I, I, didn't, I didn't raise today, it opened some surprising doors. It, it granted some welcome stability. And you know, that, that in, the Guardian Angels program, it, it was consistent with other um, initiatives at federal and provincial levels. Um, initiatives to recognize and financially re reward citizens and permanent residents who were working in certain jobs. Remember, you know, cashiers, they got hero pay um, because grocery stores were seen as, as a serious, you know, COVID vector health risk area. Hero pay, it was an incentive, an incentive that was offered to try to keep people working in those jobs. Refugee claimants and failed refugee claimants working in frontline healthcare, they became guardian angels because, in theory, in the imagination of middle class Canadians who do not understand the choicelessness of precarity, because it was believed that these individuals could have switched jobs, but selflessly chose not to. Right, so the entire set of conditions under which these individuals are living in Canada in a precarious status, taking a job when they can get no other job, um, that's erased by this, this labeling of, of, of a guardian angel and how things get getting imagined. On the other hand, the migrant workers working in agri-food, they had no real option but to continue working. Um, and, you know, for those in the healthcare positions, their respective employers were very well served by some migrant workers, these pending and failed refugee claimants, now potentially becoming permanent employees, right? The, the employers would not object to that measure. They would, they, would, they would welcome it. On the other hand, employers in agri-food, I'm not going to say all, but many, they are well served by an isolated migrant labor force, which they can, at their absolute discretion, choose to rehire or not every year. And you know, I note that Canada is effectively subsidizing agri-food by providing a workforce that'll work under conditions and low wages that Canadians largely will not abide by. So although agricultural work was deemed essential, those workers were kept disposable. And their, their lack of political voice, I mean, it's so extreme. You know, so th those measures that I took you through, those really great measures that were enacted to protect them from COVID-19 were left, they were left unenforced. What I didn't mention before is that the, the Auditor General gave um, Employment and Social Development Canada an interim report in December of 2020, right after the first summer of COVID. In that interim report, they told them that these inspections are inadequate. You have not found compliance. These responses to the outbreaks, they're not complying with the law. 
get on it. Employment and Social Services Canada said, don't worry, we're going to fix it for 2021 season. And you may recall the 2021 season was when they determined that 100% of employers were compliant, but the act, but the, but, um, the Auditor General found that 88% of the files did not demonstrate compliance. And those measures that got enforced, like only those who bunk together can work side by side, ended up putting some workers at higher risk and worsened their living conditions. And let's not forget the differential treatment at the border of under, under COVID-19 of migrant farm workers and those would-be refugee claimants. Now, the last update that I could find on the situation, that was from uh, two months ago, January 20th. Um, there were, at that moment, there were 275 migrant workers in Southern Ontario in quarantine due to an outbreak. Um, and on January 22nd, um, so just under uh, eight weeks ago, uh, another 40-year-old migrant worker from Jamaica uh, died of, of, of COVID. Um, so all of this said, I know I've gone the seesaw, I personally don't think that the window has shut on policy reform. I think it's still open and that we're gonna continue to see efforts at reform. And I'm extremely hopeful that the, um, the public eyes that have been opened on these conditions through the last two years are going to help bring about the kind of significant reforms that, that are clearly needed. And um, that's where I'm going to end my formal comments. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to hope that um, some people have some questions or queries or something. Thank you so very much, Constance. This is, uh, this is certainly a very de depressing note to end our <laughs> series on. Um, but I think that unfortunately, many of the uh, COVID related topics are very depressing because, um, and this does fit in with the series, uh, the, the series um, uh, focus this year was um, sort of beyond recovery, right? And how do we uh, managed to to move into a way of um, not just recovering or going back to uh, the way that things were before the uh, pandemic, but rather uh, changing the way things were before the pandemic. And I think that we've seen that a lot in the context of um, many areas that were significantly deficient, whether it's, uh, well, the migrant uh, worker field and generally immigration or um, prisons or uh, long-term care. The, the COVID has really shone a, a light on all of those uh, uh, significant problems and significant issues that existed. And I take your point, you were saying at, at, the, at the very end of the talk that you're sort of reframing this, that yes, the, the government has significantly failed uh, in not necessarily that the policies were not good, but the way they were implemented or the way they were uh, overseen was, uh, was, was so problematic, right? That it, in, in fact, it only re replicated the oppressive and marginalization of, uh, of uh, migrant workers or actually even further that. Um, but but you ended up on this very positive note saying you know there is still room for report you know reform and 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 i take that and i think you know that has been said about other areas um uh, as well that now perhaps we are listening more now perhaps you know uh, we have seen more because of the attention that has been paid during covid um, and maybe now we can, uh, it's time for action. So I think my, my question to you, um, before I get to, to the Q&A box, my question to you is, um, you know, I mean, I guess it's twofold. It On one hand, you know, the time, arguably the time for action or, was when, when the need was highest, when the government has such a strong incentive to, um, to do better, right? There, there's never been a time probably in the recent history that this was more of an incentive in terms, in, in the sense that, um, you know, we really needed this, uh, these migrant workers both to come to Canada and do the work, but also to do this kind of work uh, that, um, that Canadians did not want to do for, for, for public uh, health reasons and personal health reasons. So 
if that didn't happen then, and there were so many ways of covering that, um, isn't there a concern that the incentives are only going to be sort of dropping for that to happen? And that, um, you know, even the public eye, yes, is wide open, but um, as, as, uh, as sort of COVID uh, wears out, people are moving on to, to other concerns. So um, how, you know, how should this pressure look like, I guess, for the reforms and the lessons learned during COVID to actually be implemented? So that's one. Um, and, and two, um, what would those significant reforms look like? How, how will they actually uh, change? Because it seems that it's almost like a cultural change beyond in terms of, as you noted, you know, the way we understand, uh, I love that Southern poverty and order legal exceptionalism. Uh, it seems that it's more than a legal measure or policies. We've seen those are plenty, but rather it's almost a, a culture that all these parts of the system need to, need to engage with. Um, yeah, so those are just uh, some of the thoughts that, that came to my mind. Uh, yeah, so um, so it's the, the, the places where uh, where we need to see these changes, where I do believe these changes are going to come, it, it's really about the underlying structure, right? You know, so COVID was a disaster in terms of how well it was managed in, in, in many ways. Not entirely. Like, it, we, Canada did a pretty good job at um, all kinds of ad hoc measures that got thrown into place when it became apparent that farms were failing to do what they were supposed to do. Um, so for example, um, in British Columbia, they took over doing all of the quarantining and isolation housing. And in Southern Ontario, they also began using hotels and other facilities to create a safe place where people could actually be isolated because the, the, uh, the farm owners were not doing these things. So we did have these moments of sort of ad hoc federal intervention during COVID, which I think were, were fairly you know, effective. Um, but it's the underlying system that's the real problem. And in, in particular, it's you know, the, the housing and how that is addressed. And it's these closed work permits and the, the structure of the agreements between the home states and Canada. And we saw some interesting pushback from home states this year. So um, at one point, um, Mexico told Canada that they weren't going to send any more workers unless the housing conditions that um, people were quarantining under were addressed because they had received sufficient communications that they were actually willing to put these contracts on the line. Um, and so, and Canada, and, and changes were made to address those complaints by source countries. Um, not all source countries did um, such good stuff. So Jamaica, I was mortified. Um, Jamaica realized that they were sending people into high risk settings, like these massive congregate settings. And what Jamaica did was they required everyone who was coming to Canada uh, to work as a seasonal farm worker, to sign a waiver that they would not hold the Jamaican government responsible um, if they had any, if they contracted COVID and had any repercussions or, or died from it. So they signed their life away and they, they still came because of the, the Southern poverty. But I've, I've kind of digressed a little bit. Um, coming out of the pressures that I think were um, augmented during COVID, uh, there is a massive housing review that's going on right now. That is, and, and the problem, one of the problems with housing is that housing is um, regulated provincially. And so there's been like this jurisdictional, um, you know, the federal government's responsible for this program, but the housing is provincial. And so it's just too complicated <laughs> for us to figure out, says the various government entities involved. Um, there is now a concerted effort to try to bring together these regimes, sort of like, um, I don't know, like a Jordan's principle, uh, but for you know migrants, right? To, to, to recognize that we can't allow these, these sorts of gaps to continue. And um, different um, migrant advocacy groups who you know, are people 
the, you know, NGOs, there's a lot of migrant workers themselves who are leading members of these groups. Um, they are compiling very extensive reports and identifying these sorts of changes that they would say would make the difference on the ground. And this is um, super important. I think we've seen this through a, over a lot of sectors in the last few years, the shift between um, academics, me sitting in my chair saying, this is what people need for their housing versus the people who are doing these jobs identifying what specific changes they need to see in place for them to feel safe and 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 respected so we have some some housing things happening and you know we saw a little bit of move with this this recognition of abusive uh, work conditions being being broadened um, i think that that's kind of opened the door a little bit. And I think we're going to see uh, a bigger push for open work permits. Um, and I think the Auditor General is really angry with the, um, uh, with the federal government um, about how they've managed things. Um, and so I'm hoping we're going to see some, some, some pressure there as well. So I kind of answered your question, but I slipped in a few other things on the side. No, that's uh, that's great, and I'm 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 actually quite happy to hear that there is more going on as a result of this than I actually imagined. Because in the other areas that I'm more familiar with, I know it's all talk and very <laughs> little action. Like we're all like, oh, we should change things, and nothing. There's nothing really in. So it, this is actually quite promising. So I can see why you are uh, more optimistic, I guess, about it than despite yeah, and, the poor results. Yeah, and at my last count. There are 20 lawsuits that have been brought against uh, Scotland sweet pack growers um, on, by or on behalf of migrant workers who worked there over the last two years. So if you want to see um, a cultural shift in how employers behave and how these agreements get negotiated and how laws get respected, um, I think litigation is unfortunately um, well, it's a very powerful tool if you manage to mobilize it, and it's getting it's getting mobilized. Um, I don't want to monopolize. Oh, sorry. But no, I, I was because I do now that you just mentioned it. I do have one very quick question, um, and I would encourage people if they have questions to put them in the Q and A. I know there are a couple. Um, we so. are not letting people um, um, speak live, but please, any comments that you have, note them in the Q and A. Um, but. In, in those terms, um, has there been any movement that you know of in terms of access to justice for migrant workers, in terms of um, all these lawsuits that are going on, right? You'd probably require legal counseling and you require all those things. And of course, um, these people are, are not people of means. Is there any kind of support uh, for them in bringing these actions? Are there certain organizations that are doing uh, work on behalf of migrant workers, pro bono work on behalf of migrant workers? Yeah, so it's all, it's all pro bono. So it's uh, legal aid offices, oh. Oh, good. Um, and it's migrant worker alliances and organizations um, that are are working extremely hard to do things. Sometimes they have um, legal counsel supporting them. Sometimes they they don't, um, and they're using other legal information resources to to move things. Um, and it's it's really heartening. Like I'm 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 very. I'm mortified that we have hit such a low place, and I have such um, belief in these grassroots informed um, organizations to, to push things. Um, and on that note, actually, we have uh, we have one of those uh, represented here. So um, if you're looking at the chat box, and I think that everybody has access to the chat box, Stacy. <laughs> Uh, Gomez is writing that she is part of this organization called No One Is Illegal, which is set in Halifax, and um, they are engaged in mutual aid support with migrant workers throughout Nova Scotia. So um, if people are interested in getting involved and are interested in uh, working with this organization and supporting uh, uh, the efforts of the migrant workers and uh, on all the issues really that you've heard about from uh, Professor McIntosh today, you can you can reach uh, you should uh, reach out to uh, to no one is illegal and um, there is a there is an email address in the in the box there um, outreach at migrant justice 
uh, ns.ca. So um, do do that. Thank you for sharing this, uh, Stacy. And Stacy has also shared an, um, a star article on the issues regarding migrant workers uh, and uh, 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 complaints within the Nova Scotia context. That's also in the in the box. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, there is uh, there are a couple of questions that I want to I want uh, to put to you um, from uh, the the audience. One of them is uh, similar to I think in certain ways to my question regarding a uh, push it for change. And um, but but it's uh, it goes a little more specific and it says. Uh, uh, could a system of own work site independent observer or advocates reporting to social justice community organizations uh, work uh, uh, who in turn hold industry and government accountable, would that be something that perhaps could be uh, um, created or implemented within the system to ensure, I guess, oversight and accountability? Um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it is the, um, independent observers and advocates uh, who are generating um, our first-hand knowledge of this disjuncture between what the rules say, which look like, I think they're problematic, but they don't look horrendous, but this disjuncture between what the rules say and what's, what's actually happening. And these organizations do produce, you know, very well researched and carefully documented reports on, on findings. Um, so they're doing that. The challenge, of course, is getting those who are responsible for enforcement um, paying attention and, 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 and acting. Um, but yeah, I think it would be fantastic if we had a, a formal, uh, formal arm's length inspection bodies that were peopled by you know, representatives. So you know, I would include in that um, you know, in this organization, you know, groups who represent the industry side of things, who are doing these on-site inspections, along with the advocates, along with the representatives of the migrant workers. I, I put them all together in doing these inspections. Um, and I think that would be great. I don't know that there's federal appetite, but who knows, right? Like I, like I said, I think that this, this window is, is cracking more open um, than it has in, in a very long time. And, okay, so I see, asked, see that someone asked what institutions took the lead in the Guardian Angel program. Um, it, once again, the Guardian Angel program, it was a result of um, uh, refugee advocacy groups pointing out that um, refugee claimants and failed refugees had contracted COVID working in long-term care homes from the Canadians that they were looking after. So a lot of uh, press work was done to inform the public of what was happening and who was now looking after everybody's, you know, aging mom and dad or brother or sister. And I think that that helped to turn the public tide. And then it was an idea from, unbelievably, uh, Premier Legault in Quebec was the one who said that he thought he would create a special program. I was like, what? Quebec is being welcoming. To, I mean, one of the criteria was that they had to be able to speak French, but anyway, um, in the Quebec version of this program. And then Canada developed one as well. So it, it started as an, an inkling of Quebec um, to, they said to thank these selfless people. Um, and then the, the feds came on board as, as, as well with a federal program also called um, Guardian, Guardian Angels. Um, and yeah, public versus private ownership structure may well have been part of it. You know, it, it's hard to it's hard to track causality with these sorts of policy changes. Um, so I'm Carson, can you read the question that you're responding just in case oh, people can see? I'm sorry. So the, the question I was just trying to respond to was about which institutions took the lead in developing the Guardian Angel program um, and about the um, whether the ownership structure of private versus public might be relevant. And so I'm just seeing a question from Sheila, which refers to this failed human rights complaint. Um, and she asks if the statutory human rights system is a source for systemic remedies um, or where the main barriers to a meaningful response from statutory human rights system. So 
Um, let's see. Part of why human rights complaints um, don't work out so well for migrant workers is because those in farm situations are exempted from almost all workplace standards. So they are statutorily excluded and working in this state of exceptionalism. Now, with that human rights complaint that I referred to, it was a um, uh, it had to do with a worker who had, had died, and the family wanted an inquiry into his death, like a workplace inquiry, and it was denied. And they brought a human rights complaint because death workplace inquiries are mandated when the death occurs in mining or construction. And they argue that it should also take place when it's a migrant worker working in agriculture because of their level of vulnerability and the invisibility of their death. And the Human Rights Commission found that despite this gross vulnerability, that the standards for an inquiry were not met and so this wasn't discriminatory and the reason why they weren't met was because and this is basically boiled down to in mining and in construction when people die they die in all kinds of different ways and so there's lessons to be learned about preventing future deaths through an inquiry but when people die in uh, farm sites the most common cause is tractor rollovers and um, equipment like pull-in equipment problems. And so because we already know how they mostly die, there's no point in having an inquiry. And that was how this individual died as well. It was when a, um, uh, a large uh, tobacco, uh, like 2000 pound uh, tobacco container fell over on him when it was being lifted. So the court said, this isn't discriminatory because we already know how they die. <laughs> um, it wasn't a very satisfying, human rights complaint to, uh, to, to read. Um, we and, had, okay, so there's Do couple. you want me to read the next one? Sure. Um, so there is a question here. Oh, um, I'll, I'll actually uh, go to the last one because it's related. Somebody's asking, is there a place for complaints to labor boards? Um, so yes, in so for the legislation that they haven't been um, left out of, right? So some legislation excludes them. Um, for health and safety though, they haven't been excluded under health and occupational safety legislation. So complaints can be brought through that method. The, the hard thing though, is that as soon as someone um, looks like they're gonna bring a complaint, um, the, the, the farmer can uh, repatriate them ostensibly on the ground of non-compliance. They can put them on a plane that day. And once the person, you know, is, is back in a Southern Caribbean source country, it's extremely hard for them to bring any sort of legal action. Right, they're not going to be permitted to come into Canada to testify. Maybe with Zoom, the situation might moderate somewhat. But basically, once they're gone, um, they can't get that claim filed. Um, and they're never going to get a job again working in industry with the current system. So one of the many things that we need to get rid of is the employer power to, without reason, um, not recall workers in subsequent years, right? They need to give a justification that doesn't show an abuse of discretion to not recall a worker. And we also need to um, uh, uh, create oversight of the exercises of power by the employer to deport, right? It cannot merely be a consultation with the home consulate. There needs to be once again, an independent body um, who can determine if the, the repatriation um, is, is legitimate uh, or if it's once again an abuse of that discretionary power. Um, 
and I don't know quite know what's happening. Okay. Um, so we have one more here. Yeah. Um, that's asking you what is the relationship between agricultural exceptionalism and the precarity of the seasonal workers program? And um, does the Canadian agricultural exceptionalism, um, uh, or rather, is that the basis for this kind of labor exploitation? So that, that's a complex question to answer. So in agriculture, as mentioned, we, we you know, a, 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 an average work week is going to be 80 hours, and that's a-okay. Um, because of the exemptions from um, uh, our labor rules. And you can work seven days um, a week and, and so on, and only have a vacation day every 10. Um, so agriculture exists differently, and that's because of the, the growing season. That's how it's justified. So we're starting with that situation. Um, and I think the, the, the real source of the um, exceptionalism for the seasonal workers is that they are racialized people from the south who often speak no English and you know the difference that getting one of these jobs makes is they'll be able to afford to send their children to junior high school um, which would otherwise be unattainable to them so you know this system has developed which like nobody would be applying for these jobs if it didn't make such a fundamental difference in their lives. And that's why this sort of, um, these rules and these practices can remain in place is that there will always continue to be desperate people who will work under these um, unconscionable conditions. And I think that is, unless there is um, uh, any other kind of question we're gonna have to uh, sort of wrap it up at this point. Uh, I think we could <laughs> probably carry on talking for the rest of the day. Um, but uh, I just want to note uh, Stacy's comment in the chat as well. Uh, she is uh, noting that um, she's noting that uh, no one is illegal is organizing an online webinar on Sunday, March 20th at 1 p.m. Uh, where they will discuss the state of migrant worker rights in Nova Scotia. So uh, this is part of the National Day of Action, calling for full and permanent immigration status for all migrants. Um, and um, um, Stacey is providing a link where people can uh, uh, found, find out more about it or register for the event. Uh, thank you for that. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Constance, uh, for, for this very engaging uh, presentation and discussion. Clearly, it has gathered a lot of interest. And um, uh, for those of you who uh, want to rewatch or share it with others, uh, uh, the, uh, the session is recorded and will be available tomorrow on uh, Schulich School of Law YouTube channel. Um, and um, that's it for uh, for today. That's it for our uh, Health uh, Law Institute seminar series for this year. Stay tuned for next year. And thank you so much for attending. And thanks again, Constance. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.